Welcome back to Menninger Mindscape. I'm Dr. John Oldham, Chief of Staff at the Menninger Clinic, and we have a series of podcasts. I hope you've seen some of them already. And today we have a very interesting guest, a member of our faculty and our staff here, Dr. Chris Fowler. Chris, welcome. Thank you, John. Chris is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry um, here in the Department of Psychiatry at Baylor and is our Associate Director of Clinical Research here at the Menninger Clinic. Uh, and Chris has been very active in um, leading and participating in a number of our research activities, but one we want to talk about today is one we cooked up a kind of clever sort of nickname for that we call Mind MB. So I'll tell you what that stands for. It stands for the McNair Initiative for Neuroscience Discovery at Menninger and Baylor. And the McNair name reflects the generous support from uh, the Bob and Janice McNair Foundation, and we are indebted and grateful to them uh, for their support. We also have support for this project from the board of the Menninger Clinic and also from the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Baylor. So the project is pretty far underway. We had a chance in another podcast to talk to Dr. Alok Madan about our outcomes data collection here. But pick up there, Chris, and tell us a little bit about how that's important and what the MindMB project is all about. Sure. Well, I think of the outcomes platform, the data that we collect on patients at admission, throughout their treatment, and then post-discharge, it's really sort of forming the first layer of a layer cake. And so the foundation data um, of patients' characterization of their disorders, their illness progress, and their response to treatment forms the most foundational aspect of the mind and be. Then the second layer, if you will, is the neuroimaging data, uh, which involves both structural scan, uh, scans of uh, sort of the functional capacity of the brain, and some tasks that we've uh, cooked up or used, borrowed from other uh, study designs. And, and we're going to hear from Dr. Ramiro Salas, who is one of our colleagues uh, in the basic science division, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit that in more detail. Yeah. Then the third layer is the genetic sequencing, which we've not yet undertaken, but uh, we are banking the blood uh, at current. So those three components, we hope, will allow us to study not just specific disorders and specific illness courses, but also cross-cutting dimensions of psychopathology. So one of the things we are more aware of now than we were 20 years ago is the fact that even within a specific disorder, there is great heterogeneity. And beyond the heterogeneity such that one patient with major depression may look almost completely different than another patient with major depression, is the fact that almost every patient who has a single disorder will have a second disorder. So the issue of comorbidity comes into play. Well, one of the areas you know that I've been interested in during my career is the personality disorders, and many of our patients here struggle with uh, pretty long-term conditions uh, that uh, we identify as personality disorders, and those are examples of conditions that have a lot of internal heterogeneity as well as um, a lot of comorbidity, whereas they occur together, and the question is, are they really separate illnesses, or are they variations of one big thing? Precisely, and that, I think that is a looming question in the field of psychiatric research, and a question that has been raised in the last four to five years by Tom Ensel and the National Institute of Mental Health with a new initiative to study these cross-cutting dimensions of psychopathology. Tom, you may remember, was one of our speakers in our big symposium to launch this new building, this new facility, not so new anymore, we've been here two years. But he gave a very interesting talk and, and touched on that, that agenda, which he's very, very committed to. So wh what is that? Well, I, I was at that meeting, so, uh, and I was taken with the concept, the concept being, our current approach to diagnoses uh, may be lacking significantly because we come at it from the angle of phenomenology first and then try to study the uh, underlying dimensions 
uh, in that order. Uh, he and the RDOC initiative, the Research Domain Criteria Initiative, turns that on its head and says we should begin with cross-cutting dimensions of psychopathology, things that we have a great deal of information about, and then begin to look at neurological markers, neurocircuits, genetic markers, and combine that data to then begin to understand psychopathology at its most fundamental and foundational level. And so... So, so it's, in a way, it's sort of taking it back to the neurobiological fault with an effort really to have a better handle on what we think the etiology may be of what we see at the other end, which is what it leads to in terms of how people struggle and have difficulties. Exactly. So if we take an example of what this might look like in a study or a study design, we might take something like um, rejection sensitivity which is uh, very paradigmatic of borderline personality disorder. It's, in fact, it's been suggested as a phenotype for borderline personality disorder. But we also know that many other patients, some of whom don't have personality disorders, are also very sensitive to rejection, social rejection, and their symptomatology either uh, emerges in the context of a major life event like a divorce or separation or a loss, or is exacerbated because of such things. We can study that, and we can study that phenomena both in terms of our diagnostic data, our patient's response to treatment, but we can also study that in the fMRI environment with one of the tasks that you'll hear about later from Romero. It's called Cyberball, which is a social ostracism task. Then we'll also look at genetic markers that may be associated with this. There's a serotonin transporter gene that has been associated with uh, hyper-responsivity to rejection. We combine those together and we may begin to see that social rejection uh, is a significant sort of common factor among many psychopathologies that we currently have and it may form a cluster around certain psychopathologies. See, that's really interesting and, and then would, would it be fair to say that as those sort of patterns come better and better into focus, one can then try to link them to common experiential events. I guess one way to be thinking about it is that we all have potential genetic susceptibilities to various things that run in our families, like diabetes or depression. But we may not hit the stress or we may hit the stress that precipitates it. And one of the things a lot of interest is, is really um, focused on is the developmental period when we call it attachment develops. And Peter Fonagy, who works with us here, has been helping us understand that. So one thing we could look at is, were there major disruptions in the attachment process? Were there real problems that interfered with the ability to grow confident and trusting in an adult caretaking figure that then sets the stage for a healthy sort of well-being mental status as an adult. Mm -hmm. Disruption or derailment of those early processes can set the stage for a lot of different kinds of problems that could then link to some of the things you're talking about. And tracing all that back then to what the vulnerability and susceptibility to that stress is, is kind of in, along the lines of the RDOC project you were talking about. It stands for Research Domain Criteria, which doesn't mean it very much to many of us, but uh, it really means what you were talking about. So did I put that together in a way that makes sense? Yes, uh, very you would, much. You wouldn't tell me if I didn't. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in fact, it does. And uh, it, at least in terms of the, uh, the aspirations of the RDOC initiative, it includes not only redefining psychopathology and the cleavage points around what constitutes one type of disorder versus another, but also beginning to look for different mechanisms of change 
and interventions that might make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah? You know, it's interesting because we're at a point where we've got technology now in the field of psychiatry. We've had it in lots of fields of medicine, but not so much in psychiatry. And so now we're able to look under the hood. The motor's running hot or the body's got a fever, but now we've got a capacity to look inside all the way from true visualization mm -hmm. to molecular neurobiology and learn about what's right and what's not and where things we hope we can find out um, have broken down. That's, that's exciting stuff. It's very exciting. There's one final level to the mind and bee study that bears on this very question about intervention and what may bring about change, which is for all the patients who agree and consent to the study, go through the imaging task, get their blood drawn at close to admission. Mm -hmm. About 21 days after, we invite them back to repeat the sequence again. So we're going to repeat the imaging task, but we'll also repeat the genetic sequencing. And I think particularly in the genetic sequencing, we look at epigenetics, the way in which uh, environment and intervention can turn off and turn on certain genes. And this may be one of those areas that we later down the road when we have enough subjects, we can begin to identify potential key points that may turn off certain genes. One of them may be along the lines of this rejection sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Are there certain environmental factors, or medications, neurostimulation, et cetera, that may have a key role to play in turning those off. I mean, and, and one of the reasons we're able to do that is that unlike most acute hospital services where um, the length of stay is pretty brief, we have patients from six to eight weeks, and so we can have enough time to do kind of a front door and back door with a substantial interval in between where it's reasonable to expect that we might see change. Absolutely true. That fact and the fact that we have funding sources that will allow us to do this kind of very intensive, very expensive research is a real bonus. Yeah, and we're very fortunate that we do, one of which is the McNair Foundation and, and um, this program. We really appreciate the support of the foundation for. So Chris, we also appreciate your work and your leadership, both in this area and other parts of the research that's going on and also the clinical work, which you do a lot of as well. Well, thank you, John. I can't think of a better place to work and do research than the Menninger Clinic. So Good. thank you for Good. bringing me on. And I didn't prompt you to say that, did I? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us and thank you all. Uh, we'll see you next time.